it probably came from when I was very young. My parents um, pushed me towards STEM and gave me a lot of like exercise books for mathematics. And I actually enjoyed it. Like I was doing it in my free time. In this episode of the Ken's Nearest Neighbors podcast, I had the pleasure of speaking with Christina Stathopoulos. Christina is originally from the U.S., but she's been based in Madrid, Spain since 2012. Working as an expat and dedicated to the world of data, she's followed a unique path to make a name for herself within the field on a global level. She's currently working as an analytical consultant at Google and adjunct faculty member at IE Business School, where she also does guest lecturing all while maintaining quite an active schedule as an international speaker and thought leader. Her core work at Google involves empowering top advertising clients to make data-driven business and marketing decisions, while her academic work focuses on teaching analytics topics to MBA students. She's also passionate about pursuing for more diversity in tech, a love of travel, and books. In this interview, we talk about her experience moving to and working in another country, how she got involved in public speaking within the analytics space, and why she loves reading so much. Thank you so much for agreeing to chat with me, Christina. Uh, I'm sure many people have seen you all over LinkedIn. You've been doing quite a bit of speaking lately. And uh, I'm really grateful. I'm really honored to have you come in and, and talk with me about your experiences, ma mainly about uh, working in the data space abroad. That's something for me that's, that's completely uh, foreign, should I say? Yeah, so thank you so much, first of all, for inviting me on. Super happy to be here today. And yeah, we can definitely touch on this because I think my journey, we'll get into it later, but my journey followed a very odd path because a lot of people moved to the U.S., whereas I did the opposite. I'm from the U.S. and, and I left. <laughs> well, I personally love odd paths. I think something that a lot of people don't realize is that there's no real traditional route into data science or into work or into whatever profession you do. Everyone's journey is a little bit unique. And the more we hear stories about how people did it, quote unquote, unconventionally, the more we can frame the things that we want to find in our own journey. And it's less about, oh, I have to do this. And it's like, oh, I want to find maybe more of this, more different culture in my journey through work or whatever it is, or I want to find more um, you know, travel or, or energy or whatever that might be. So again, I, I love hearing uh, these types of stories, specifically your story, though, because we, we've talked, uh, you know, uh, uh, quite a bit offline, uh, and and I think it is so fascinating, so interesting. So let's start kind of at the beginning. Like, how did you first get interested in like data and analytics in general? I know that that isn't necessarily on the same timeline as your your story about going abroad, but we can kind of weave those two together if you want. Yeah, yeah. My, anyways, my, my path is not, it's not a straight line path. So if we talk about analytics, just analytics, um, I first got interested in it just because from a young age, I love technology and numbers. My favorite subjects was, was math. Um, so it was kind of a natural path for me. And it eventually led me into studying an interdisciplinary field with a concentration in statistics. Um, and that was for my bachelor's. And I went on to do a master's in business analytics and big data and eventually a full on career in analytics. So my entire, you know, my, my educational journey. And even since I was a kid, I always loved, you know, the subjects of math and statistics. So for me, it was very, very natural. Awesome. I'd love to hear more about this, I guess, interdisciplinary undergraduate degree that you had. I think that's something that's becoming more common. There's becoming like data science undergraduate degrees. I get asked about hey, I'm majoring in information information systems. Can I become a data scientist or get into data with that? And, you know, I, I, I personally believe, not to, not to bias your answer too much, but um, that, like, what you major in is, like, it's important. Like, you learn things in school, but there's so much beyond just what you study that, that makes you capable to, to get a job in the space or anything beyond that. Um, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and actually, I had started in civil engineering. Um, I thought that my natural path would be engineering. That makes sense for, for mathematics, you know? And I ended up changing to this interdisciplinary field. I'll explain to you what it is. It's very odd. It started out of Stanford and only a few other universities offer it now. It's called Science, Technology, and Society. Um, and it's an interdisciplinary field that focuses on studying the impacts of green technologies mainly on uh, society. 
and how it's shaping the, the modern world, connecting back to history as well. And then within this interdisciplinary field, you, you're supposed to, um, to pick an area to focus on. So when I said GRIN before, it's, it's uh, genetics, robotics, informatics, and nanotechnology. I focused on the um, informatics one and I ended up doing statistics. So that was my focus in statistics. Uh, did a lot of work actually in SAS. If you know, if you're familiar with the software SAS, it was actually invented at my alma mater. I was studying in the building where they invented SAS. So that was pretty cool. cool. Um, but the, the, the degree was very, it's a very odd degree, I would say. And I think back then, I graduated in 2012. So there weren't really data science degrees. I don't, I, I wasn't familiar with them. I know that my university had statistics, of course, you could study a bachelor's in statistics, but it hadn't evolved to the point of offering uh, data science yet, which is now a lot more, a lot more common. But my interdisciplinary field, I would definitely say is, is a bit off there, off <laughs> the, the normal path, but it was super interesting for me and it, and it really, um, it matched to my interest. I didn't like civil engineering. The moment I switched, I loved what I was studying. I, I really want to highlight that too, because I, I think when you go to school, you should be passionate about what you're studying. And I also generally recommend for people, I might not have said this publicly yet, but if your school offers a unique program, like, like or, or not completely unique, but a very specialized program that other schools don't, like it's, it's worth considering taking it. One, because you learn something that your school has obviously put a lot of resources and interest in, and the, the quality of education is probably very high, but also because outside looking in, let's say we're, we're an employer or let's say you're hiring someone, if you see something that is uh, not necessarily a black sheep, but is different from a lot of what the candidates are, are, say, are coming in with, let's say everyone is, has a data science degree now or a computer science degree, and you see someone with a degree that like, wow, this is relevant to the field or to the position, but it's not what all these other people are doing, that person's gonna stand out in they're just going to stand out in general and it's up to them if after the interview they make that a positive thing or a negative thing but like you always in my mind want to stand out a little bit have a little a couple unique things uh about your person and um you know it, i don't know if you did that by design but uh i i think that i would hope i would like to think that that decision has has been a very positive one for you yeah for me and i think it, it all came down to also selling it how I sold what I ended up learning. Um, it definitely helps you stand out. It's sparked conversations with people that they're like, oh, what is this degree? I've never heard of it. What, what, did you, what were you studying? Um, and I think it's very, very relevant for the times, yeah. my specific degree. But I think we can't, we can't bring away the importance of data science or computer science degrees. Those are, those are very important as well. Um, so I think, you know, you can't, you can't go wrong either way, but you can try this path, which is a bit more unconventional. And it's just a matter of later selling uh, your worth after that program, but it definitely uh, helps st standing out. It, it helps you stand out. Yeah. I, I love that. That's not something um, that, that, that I have personally addressed before. The idea of selling is that, I, I think you can come from almost any degree, but if you can very clearly explain why, like why this made sense, why this is part of your kind of grander story of how you got here and whether it's for the position or for whatever it is, um, that's all that really matters, right? You know, I could have studied history and be like, look, like, I, like my history degree is very focused in like the history of math. And that's been fascinating to me. And like that translates into data science in some way, like, great. like it's continuous with everything. And if I was studying like health exercise science and I'm telling a employer that like, no, I just one day I realized I wanted to get a job. So I switched majors and or so I like, I like took some certificates and now I'm here. There's no continuity with that, right? It's like, I, I might've done that in some way, shape or form in my, in my past, but um, like the story attached to it means so much more than just, um, than just what, like what's on the piece of paper, which which is hopefully enlightening to quite a few people out there. Yeah, it's it's connecting the dots. And when you when you put it on a CV, on a resume, it might not be so clear at first. That's also why it's very important to prepare like your elevator pitch. You have your CV, you know, on a piece of paper, but how then when you're telling your story, how do you connect the dots between your your education and your experience? 
Yeah, I love that. And, you know, I, I think the cover letter has gone out of vogue. I still write them if I'm applying. Granted, I haven't applied in a while. But that's one more place where you can actually tell that story, right? They're, they're saying, hey, like, write us something. Write us something compelling about why you should be here. In my opinion, even if, like, the odds they read it are 20%, you know, you're applying for, for like a very highly competitive job. Why wouldn't you just put that out there? If it can sway them or can help connect the dots for them, why not? Right. I mean, maybe it's a little yeah. extra time. You have to, to, to map that one out on your own, but um, no, I, I a hundred percent love that. And yeah, so and I agree on the, on the cover letters, by the way, I haven't been applying in a while, but I still do believe that they're important. And it's, it's really important in that case, if you want to tell your story of why you, why you fit for this role, especially if you come from a, a more unconventional background. Yeah. And, you know, I, I also think it's probably just a good thought exercise for everyone listening to like, think about your story. Think about yep. like, okay, I, I'm the hero of the story. What makes it interesting? What are some of the pivotal moments? When did I have like an aha moment that, that makes sense for me to be at this company now? Um, you know, if, if I was an employer and I'm looking at a, at a candidate, I'm looking at their resume, I'm looking at their history and if the next step of their story is logically for them to work here, that's a pretty compelling thing. Is that, oh, everything, like the stars seem to be aligning, they should work here. Um, you don't find that with a lot of candidates. It's, it's a lot of like shotgun tactics or, but, but you know, some people it's like, oh, you know, I've done this in the past, I've done this, this in the past and they can cherry pick it, right? But if you get the employer thinking, oh, like, well, that, that makes good sense. Like this person, they, they've clearly thought this through about how they've gotten here. I, I love to see that. And I don't quite see it as much as I would hope to. Maybe I'll see it more after we, uh, after we release this interview. <laughs> yeah, well, people, that, then it's something that people need to work on. I think it's super important, telling your story, connecting the dots. And like you said, you can do cherry picking. You don't necessarily have to. Maybe there was a year that it kind of doesn't fit into the story. Well, then leave it out. Yeah, I agree. I, I think I was doing a lot of resume reviews for a while on my YouTube channel. And one thing I found is that almost like almost everyone, that, that's a, maybe that's sorry, about half the people would have resumes that were like two or three pages long. And at least in the States, that's a big no-no, unless you have a PhD, unless you've, you know, worked for 25 years, like, the resume should be a highlight reel. It should be like, these are the most important things. This is like a very powerful short story, not kind of a long and boring novel. And we'll obviously talk more about books down the road. So I wanted to throw in just a little bit <laughs> of a, of a, uh, some, some foreshadowing per se, or a, or a flag associated with that. But um, yeah, you know, that's, that's something that um, I, I, I didn't quite notice or know that people uh, were like, I call them jammers. They try and jam everything in. And uh, that's not a good practice, right? In data science, we want to simplify everything. We want to make everything as straightforward and concise as possible. Um, and as well, that's the bonus of LinkedIn nowadays. Yes. You can have your one page CV. And if you want to put more details, put it on LinkedIn. Yeah, but LinkedIn. Don't, you're, you're right. Don't, don't do two, three pages of a CV. Yeah, honestly, I'd rather see a, a CV with like some light text than like links to their LinkedIn, links to their GitHub, links to a personal website if they have it. Because yeah, realistically, if they have a link, I, I Google everyone that I interview. You know, it's it's like I'll I'll learn as much about from them from the stuff that maybe they don't want me to see. It's not like I'm going on their Facebook or anything, but like you always see what pops up. Like if they publish anything, if they have a, a presence. Um, yeah, and it's. It's a different world than I guess when we were applying uh, for the for absolutely, the <laughs> totally, totally. So I want to kind of just touch on before we move into your your work abroad and and the beginning, I guess, of your like your true career path and journey is just about learning some more of the technical skills. Obviously, you did a technical degree, um, I think multiple technical degrees, uh, yes. if I remember correctly, and. Um, you know, did you did you supplement that learning? Did you learn everything you know about data and analytics from school, or how did you combine that with with outside sources? If you did it all, yeah, yeah, I did. Um, so the the like theory, the statistics and mathematics that came very easy from me for the start, and and that was a part of my undergraduate degree. A lot of statistics, so that that's always been easy for me. But 
I first got exposed to coding during my bachelor's studies when I was studying with SAS, like I mentioned before, I was doing statistical modeling within SAS. Um, and that was, that was my only real coding uh, experience in the bachelor's. So before I started my master's, which I started in 2015, I did self-learning. So that's when I started getting into Python R SQL. Uh, and I remember specifically my favorite course that I did online was the was the Python for Everybody course on Coursera. Uh, I don't know if, if listeners are familiar with it, you will know what I'm talking about because the professor, he's from University of Michigan and he's he's fabulous, he's amazing. And he does a wonderful job of like building up from zero to you know building up and, and learning Python and he makes it fun. Um, so I did do, I supplemented a lot of self-learning right before my master's. And then, of course, um, I applied all of that, you know, newly acquired coding skills at a deeper level within my master's. Awesome. And so you mentioned that some of the math and the technical stuff, or I guess the theory came relatively easy to you. I'm interested into why you think that is. Is it just that you've been doing it for a long time? Um, I, I usually find people reaching out to me with kind of the opposite feeling. It's that this doesn't come easily to me at all. And I wonder if we can maybe decode that a little bit, like this is why it comes easily to you and maybe they can pick some of that, um, you know, like leech off of some of that information to try and make it e come easier for them. I mean, I think a lot of people, th there's math people and there's not math people. <laughs> you, you like it or you hate it pretty much. And I say it came easy to me just because since I, that was my favorite subject growing up. Uh, later in high school, I was taking college level courses. When I was 15, 16, I was already getting credits out of the way um, in statistics and calculus. But I don't know, I mean, for me, it was natural. And also it, it probably came from when I was very young, my parents um, pushed me towards STEM and gave me a lot of like exercise books for mathematics. And I actually enjoyed it. Like I was doing it in my free time, strangely enough. They would give me, I would ask for more math books so I could solve the problems and I enjoyed it. So I'm guessing that it comes out of that very young habit of liking numbers and it just went on through the years. It doesn't mean that you have to have grown up with that kind of exposure. I think you can still get, um, you can get the skills. You might not enjoy it as much as I do. And that's just something that you'll have to get used to over time. And hopefully it'll grow on you. I would hope that others, it would grow on them, the um, the fun in problem solving with, with mathematics. <laughs> well, I, I think you're 100, you might not have explicitly said it, but I, I something, I, so I came from the opposite where growing up, I was like bad at math. I, I wasn't really good at any academic subjects now that I think <laughs> about it. I, I completely transformed in, in grad school and whatever that might be. But, um, you know, at least on my side, um, I hated math. I hated numbers. And it wasn't till college when I took some economics course, I started to apply them. I started to really enjoy it. And then it started to become a lot easier. And, you know, to me, I, I also, I, I did this weird thing in college where I changed majors like six times. And three of those majors, I had to take a different statistics course for. So by the time I took the third statistics course, I was like pretty good at statistics <laughs> and that's le legitimately, that was the pivotal point where I was like, Oh, this is, I, I, I like doing this. I could see myself doing more of this, but it's a combination of two of the things you said. It's like, wow, I, I like this. And I also feel like I'm kind of good at it. And so I think anyone, even if you're not good at math right now, doesn't mean you can't become good at it. Like find a small section of it that you, that you, are okay with and like hammer on that and, and start try and find some way in your brain to enjoy it. And then I think that most people can develop a lot of proficiency for it, but I, you know, you I, I think your parents obviously do a very good job. Um, but obviously this is, you know, this is a lot more about you and your interests, but, uh, that that's, that's pretty cool. I, I wish, uh, I wish I had developed more of an affinity for math when I was a youth. It probably would have paid some dividends nowadays. I, I, but... <laughs> I think you did fine. I think you did fine in the end. <laughs> I appreciate that. All right. Well, let's. Uh, I, that, that was extremely informative. Let's kind of move on. I want to hear more about uh, your your work abroad, how you've 
what you learned other languages, how you've, how you've kind of gone down this road to working in, in Spain now. Yeah, so this is a very, this is how my, my story becomes more complicated and I go off the typical path into data science, I would say. Um, and uh, to give you some context, when I was finishing that, that interdisciplinary bachelor's degree, within a month of graduating, I left the country and moved to Spain. Um, wow. sold, sold my car, sold my stuff here and, and left. Um, and why did I do that? Uh, first of all, I knew that I wanted to do something different when I finished um, university, when I finished college. And I didn't want to follow the typical American path. Um, so I wanted to live in another country. I wanted to learn another language and I wanted to travel the world. And originally I was going, I was looking at Asia. I was going to go to Hong Kong, Tokyo, Bangkok, something like that. Um, but one reason I settled on Spain was for the language. I knew that if I learned Spanish, then it would pay off in the long run. So I moved to Spain with the intentions of staying for just one year. And now it's been more than eight years. Wow. <laughs> uh, so I got stuck. Um, I, never, I never expected to be able to establish a solid analytics career in Spain. I never could have imagined this happening. And although I don't plan to stay here for the long term, I want to return to the U.S., um, regardless, it's been a wonderful experience for me. Um, it's exposed me, it's helped me grow personally, but also it's exposed me to work on a more global level um, that I think I never would have gotten exposed to if I were in the US. It's very, I mean, it depends on the company, the position, but it can be very US focused. Whereas Spain, I've gotten the chance to be involved on a more international level. Um, and not to mention, I've, I've traveled a lot. So I think I, you know, I made the most of a situation and um, I mean, the dots, the dots ended up connecting for me. That's awesome. And you checked the box uh, for the travel for sure. So, uh, you know, I, I think that that's from, from what it sounds like and from what we have discussed in the past, you know, it doesn't sound like it was completely premeditated or planned. It was kind of like, I know the general direction I want to go, the non-US traditional path. I know it also wants to have some kind of analytics thrown in there. And like, I, I think it's important that you have faith in yourself that it'll eventually work out. Uh, you know, it, that, that to me is very cool. And it's refreshing because a lot of people are very concerned that, oh, I don't know what to do. I don't know what the direct specific path is. But, you know, I've also found in my life is like, okay, these are generally the things I want. If I take all the steps up, to, to potentially reaching them. Like if I don't get them, I, I at least tried, I learned a lot on the way, but like, I'll find out what I want if I have the skills and the tools and, and I've put in the hard work. Um, that, that's just so cool to me. And uh, I- uh, Yeah, and you're right about the planning. I didn't, uh, there was a lot of no planning, no planning ahead, uh, kind of taking things as they came, taking opportunities as they came and molding my path along the way and making sure that I was ultimately somehow getting to my goal of working in analytics. Because I knew I wanted to do that, but it was just a matter of how I was going to get there. I would expected to do it to develop my career in the US, ended up finding a way to do it in Spain, so I stayed. Um, so yeah, you don't necessarily have to plan everything out. And we've also learned very well this year with the pandemic, that planning Perfect. doesn't always, yeah, d doesn't always go as you as you wish. Oh my goodness, that's also one aspect of planning I'm interested in knowing is how much Spanish did you prepare before you, you know, got on the plane and left for that year? Were you, were you like taking courses? Were you doing anything like that, or were you like, nope, I'm just gonna learn it when I get there? <laughs> I was doing very little. I was doing Rosetta Stone. If you're familiar with that, the yeah. um, the language software to learn, um, I did that, and that's about it. Wow. <laughs> so I was studying online, uh, came with very little skills, and it was tough at the beginning, as I literally had to build up from from zero to now being able to work and almost fluently speak in Spanish. So it, it but it took a long time, and this is what anybody moving to another country, whether you're coming to the U.S. or another situation moving between countries, um, depending on the market, yeah, you do need to consider that you're probably going to need to pick up the local language if you want to open more doors for you. I realized that quickly in Spain that there was no way I was going to be able to work in analytics or it would be very difficult to do so without learning Spanish. English is obviously a very 
a widely used language, but you close a lot of doors if you don't speak the local language. So I, I had I had you know studied it the first couple of years, um, and and eventually got to the point where I could work, I could pass an interview in Spanish, um, but it was it was definitely a challenge. So for everyone watching who's struggling to pass their data science interviews in their native language, uh, Christina has passed passed uh, analytics interviews at, at Google no less uh, in Spanish. So just think about that. It can always you can always make it more difficult for yourself if you need to. So <laughs> I remember I remember my first analytics interview, data science interview in Spanish. I was so nervous, but it was an amazing accomplishment. To Absolutely. get through it in another language. So yeah, so definitely for anybody worrying about it, if you're doing it in your in your native language, at least be happy about that. You have that advantage. <laughs> so something on this podcast, I obviously I like to talk about data science and the analytics, but I'm also personally like very interested in just learning in general. And I was wondering if we could maybe try to talk about some of the parallels with learning a language like Spanish, and. Uh, how you learned um, like programming or something like that. I think that I say that I'm like multilingual because I can write in like Python and Java and C and, and Scala, but not exactly the case. There are some differences, <laughs> but um, yeah. But I'd love to hear about kind of that experience. What, what were some of the biggest things that helped you to pick up the language more quickly? Um, you know, I've been trying to learn Spanish and Chinese for like the last 10 years and I can, like barely introduce myself. So uh, maybe selfishly, I'm also interested in, uh, in, uh, in what the secret sauce is there. Yeah, so I think they do have their similarities, but they also have a lot of differences. When you're learning a spoken language, of course, you're learning the vocabulary first, and then you're learning things like, um, like sentence structure and grammar, and you're kind of, you learn to put the pieces together correctly. And when we talk about learning a programming language, it is kind of similar in a sense because you have to learn vocabulary. So it might be, you know, case wins or libraries, for example. And then you learn sentence structure or grammar, but that would be like the correct ordering and the structure of your code. So in that sense, you can kind of compare them. And in both cases, they definitely challenge the way that you think and they open your mind to new ways of thinking for for sure programming and then any new language that you learn it's going to open up your eyes you're going to have you know new new perspectives and um, but then i think i would but i would say though that learning a spoken language is much more difficult um because you have to learn to think on your toes and you really have to memorize everything you have to memorize the vocabulary the grammar and you have to be able to just you know it needs to come out automatically whereas for a programming language everybody uses cheat sheets let's be honest we're all Googling online or we have a side cheat sheet, whatever it is, uh, but you don't, and you don't have to memorize everything. Nobody does that. You just have to have the, the general knowledge, the ideas, the logic. So I would definitely say that learning a new language for me is, is more difficult. And then on top of that, learning a language, you need to, you have speak, you have spoken and written. Whereas coding is just, is just written, just written. of course. Yeah. Imagine speaking um, but they, code. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be interesting. <laughs> But yeah, they do. Yeah, they have their similarities for sure. But I would still say that learning a language is a lot more complicated just because of that thinking on your toes part and you have to learn to speak it as well. Awesome. I, that, that's like I could could not have. I definitely couldn't have said it better myself, but I couldn't have created that analogy as well as you did. Um, one thing I do want to touch on is like the immersive element. You know, everyone I talk to basically says if you want to learn a language, go somewhere where you can't speak anything but that language for a certain amount of time. Is that something that that was very helpful to you? Obviously, you were effectively doing that. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, and, and and this is something you can't do with coding. I don't know how you would live immersing yourself in code, matrix or something. Exactly. Uh, but, but yeah, um, immersion is necessary. And that's why I knew by going to Spain, living there, living in the language, I would learn it much better. And immersion is very, very good particularly for conversation and for spoken. Whereas written, yeah, you can learn, you know, I, I did actually learn the grammar, um, a lot of self-learning. So I did Rosetta Stone. I also bought a lot of grammar books and just did exercises, kind of just jamming it into my head. Um, but you do need, I think you do need immersion to really grasp another language. Awesome. And I, I think the closest thing to immersion with code is just applying it, like 
yeah. building stuff rather than just doing tutorials or whatever it might be. Exactly. Yeah, for that, that's a good analogy. That programming then you need to do actual projects and hands-on applications, not just practicing it. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's why that's one of the reasons I stress just projects so much. I'm actually getting my hands dirty with one now and it's driving me absolutely insane. But that's like a good thing, right? It's that you're you're pushing yourself and, and uh, you know, there's nothing more, uh, I wouldn't say awkward, but like nothing that makes you want to learn a language more than when you get stuck mid-sentence and you're looking for the word. I Granted, I do that in English sometimes still, but <laughs> um, I think that if people embrace the challenge of, of learning these things and look at it like, hey, I can see that I'm getting better. That's something that hopefully is special in, in either case that you can see the progress, you can tell that you're learning. And I, I bet I would imagine you probably remember the time when you're like, wow, I just had a full conversation in Spanish. And like, I really understood what they were saying. And I could felt like I could convey exactly what I wanted to say. Uh, that. I would imagine I can't express that because I can only do that in English, but that that was an incredible feeling. It is, it is. And like what I mentioned earlier about the interview, for me, the interview was this really golden moment for me because I realized that, wow, I could, I could actually handle an interview in Spanish. That is awesome. Before I, I actually want to talk more, uh, just, just a little bit about, um, about your, your career and, and working at Google. But before that, I do want to understand a bit more about working in a different country. I know that I took an organizational behavior class in grad school. And the thing that what took, I took away from that is that different countries, the like work customs behaviors, the, the like culture is very, very different. And from what I understand, the US has a very like, I forget what it was like a very strict and organized culture. So does Germany. So does I think Japan. Yes. And like a lot of South America, Spain, and some of Europe has a slightly like, uh, like looser, more relaxed culture. H how did you find yourself? Uh, like, like well, first, is that true? And second, yeah. how did you find yourself adjusting to that? Um, you know, is that is that has that been good for you? Like, what? Well, I, I just want to hear a lot more about it. It's fascinating to me. Yeah. No, you're you're on point. It's definitely very very different working cultures if we're comparing the U.S. and Spain. And I know this from firsthand experience and also working, I'm usually the only American. I mean, the offices that I've worked in, even before Google, I'm the only American there. And I'm surrounded by, by mainly Spanish and also a lot of, um, can be from South America as well. And it makes sense because we work in Spanish, so. Um, but the, <laughs> the, the cultures for me, working cultures definitely clash. Um, it was easy, for example, for me to adapt to the two kisses thing. So you greet everybody with two kisses and that's fine. I come from a Greek family and they do kisses. So that was an easy adaptation. But for example, the lack of punctuality, it drives me crazy. Uh, I cannot get used to it there. It's a lot more light, you know, more relaxed when it comes to timing. Whereas I'm the type that wants to be there five minutes early to everything uh, here. It's, you know, 10 minutes late, 15, whatever. We'll, we'll start when, when, when we start. When everyone's here, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so this is, this is tough for me. Um, as well, I would say one thing I've noticed is that the Spanish culture is, is very social. Um, in and out of work. It's a very social, um, social society. But within work, so work colleagues can get very close to each other. And they may expect the same out of you as a colleague. And this means spending a lot of off hours with your team, uh, much more than you would do in the US, I think. And personally, I was taught, I was always taught to have a very fine, a very, I mean, a very strong boundary between work and my personal life. Whereas in Spain, it's a lot more blurred. And this is something that I just, <laughs> as much as I try, I don't really accept it. I think just because of the way I was raised, that I think, you know, they're two separate things. You don't mix them. Whereas there, it's a lot more typical to mix them. Um, so that's one thing. And then another thing. So these are these are things that are true. And there's, there's things that are like rumors that I've heard. Um, you know, people say that Spain is very relaxed, that everybody takes a siesta in the middle of the day. And I do want to like debunk these rumors. Uh, this is not true, at least not my experience working in a big city like Madrid. Uh, the, the Spanish do like to take excessively long lunch breaks, 
but this is just to socialize over lunch. There, there's not enough time to go home and have a siesta in the middle of the day. Um, and I, I was the instigator of this rumor, so just to, to be clear. No, you're not the only one. I've, I've heard it before. Siesta, fiesta is what I've heard. I see. Um, and as far as like the relaxed part and, and work-life balance, um, Spanish can be very hardworking, very long hours. So I think that the, the relaxed idea, I think it depends more on your company, your team, than it does the country that you are based. Awesome. Well, I, I really want to highlight, uh, like I, that is a lot of really relatively new information to me. And I'd like to highlight just kind of one or two things for people that are looking to come to the US, for example, uh, or, or to go to all these, these other countries. It's that like, it, like that's part of the learning process. As, as you very well know, like, getting hired or, or getting getting an interview, whatever that might be, if you play the, the game effectively, if you understand the culture and you can assimilate well, that really increases your chances. You know, I think a lot of people coming to the US from other places, they don't understand how like direct it is, how the respect for like how relatively flat organizations are. I mean, there are some bosses I had where I like kind of talked to them like I was their boss. Um, which probably shouldn't go that far, but like, it, 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 like in in the U.S., the the culture is you, you advance by speaking your mind, which is the opposite of quite a few other cultures, um, and those are things that I think it's really important to keep in mind. You know, that's not something they teach in school, right? I feel like that's something you either probably had to read in a book or you had to just learn it firsthand and be like, wow, this is this is different. Yeah, yeah, a lot of this you learn, you learn on the job, or you learn with experience, and you have to adapt um, to a point. So I always say that you can, you do adapt to the local culture, but don't, don't lose yourself. So you, you as a foreigner, bring new perspectives, new beliefs, new customs. So don't lose that because you're bringing another perspective. And within the workplace, that's very valuable. So you can be very uh, valuable asset on the team by bringing these new perspectives. So it's kind of like finding a balance between who you are and then mixing within the, the culture. It's a very, oh. very tough balance to keep. I love that. Very, um, like very philosophical. It's, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, we kind of have the yin and yang and you're just, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I've been reading too much, I guess, like Eastern philosophy. I don't know what I'm doing these days, but <laughs> <laughs> so uh, th there's, there's kind of two more things I'd like to focus on in the interview. So the first is like, your experience, we, we talked a little bit about interviewing uh, in a different country, but like a little bit more about what that was like, you know, obviously you work at Google, which is something that's exciting to a lot of people. It's exciting to me as well, but I find that when people work at, at these like fan companies, everyone just like, they're like, oh, can you tell me about what Google's like? Can you tell me? And they like, it's kind of like uh, dehumanizing where I have a, a couple of friends that work at Amazon. They're like, these people just want to know about Amazon. They don't want to know about like me at all. Right. Um, but I would, again, like to focus this way more on you than we're going to focus on Google. I just want to put that out there, you know, uh, but um, you kind of, what was that experience like for you? You know, how did you prepare for that process, especially being in a different country and is working at Google, for example, in Spain, categorically different from working uh at Google in the US? Is there, you know, does that culture pervade differently? How much organizational culture is Google uh, supersedes like Spanish culture or whatever that might be? Yeah, I'll answer the second question first and then go back to the Sweet. to the first. The, it's the second about um, Google is, is really good about keeping their culture globally. And I've been to a lot of offices. I've been to offices in actually Moscow and Russia. I've been to Taiwan offices. Um, I've been all over Europe too, of course, in Poland and Poland uh, and London. Um, and what I've seen is that they they keep the culture very strong throughout. So I think that's a bonus. That it, and it's really cool that they're able to, to to manage that. But at the same time, you still do have like a local aspect. So the things that I told you about, you know, the meeting starting a little bit late, um, the hours that you're expected to work, as far as like what time you start and what time you start and stop can change depending on the, the culture. Some countries like to start later. Um, so you do have a like, you know, little taste of the culture within the, the office, uh, of the local culture, I mean. 
but um, but you never you never lose the Google the overall the overarching uh, Google culture stays. Very cool. Um, and then so the first question was about the interviewing process. Um, this is notoriously difficult. I can confirm that. Um, and one thing that I always recommend to people is that I think um, I think that people don't tend to put enough pre preparation into it, especially if you're going to interview in the big tech. It, it needs lots and lots of preparation. And the good thing is that nowadays there's so many resources online. You have lots of blogs, you have YouTube videos. There's so much help. Um, and, and that's what I did. I mean, I used online resources to just study, study, study. And I used, um, I used my husband to practice with, especially because I was doing it in Spanish. So mine was not just understanding, getting the concepts, studying. Then I also had to learn how to express it well in another language. So I had like that extra step of, uh, of practice that I don't wish on anyone. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, that's the key for me, I would say, is, is prepare yourself. And also just go in with a smile on your face. Well, nowadays it's, it's virtual. So go into the call with a smile on your face um, and, and keep your confidence and don't be afraid to say that you don't know. You can ask questions to clarify, get more information, um, but nobody expects you to know everything. So, and don't let that mess you up. If you don't know the answer to a question, just be honest about it. Maybe ask for some clarification in case that will help you. And if not, just move on, but don't let it get you down. Yeah, I, I, I love that. I, I think that Dealing with adversity is something that I know I look for when I'm interviewing a candidate. If they don't, if they don't know something, how do they handle it? Right? There's like two ways. Like you can either be curious about it and say, oh, like, you know, I'm interested in this. I want to understand it better. Let's let's get more context around it. What can you give me? What can't you give me? There's that like, look, like, I don't want to waste our time. I'm gonna look this up later. Like, I, I don't know this now, let's move on. Like, let's be as efficient about this as possible. Or there's like someone that just completely shuts down. And you probably don't want to hire the person that completely shuts down because exactly. what are they going to do if they don't know something at work? Um, yeah. You know, something that's impressed me is a couple of people, you know, they've gotten something wrong in an interview and they followed up with like, hey, I looked into this more. I did my research and this is what I found. Um, and I love that. That's something that to me is even better than like, oh, I don't know, and like asking more questions and still not getting to it, it shows that they want, like, they were engaged or involved enough that they were willing to like do that after the interview. It wasn't over for them. And that's the type of people that hopefully you'd want to hire, I assume. Um, yeah, yeah, but... and, and, even, and even for people, if you get rejected, let's say you don't make it through, this is also a big point that I push for is persistency. Um, so go, you, it, just because you didn't make it this time, many times there's a better candidate out there. They need, they're looking for the perfect fit. So don't also let that get you down. I didn't get in on the first time or the second time. It took me a while, but I got better over time. I got better at the interviews. <laughs> um, so that's a bonus. You can look at it. The more interview processes you go through, you start to master them. So it's okay. Um, but yeah, keeping your confidence and keeping in contact with that team because they might, they might like you, but you just weren't the perfect fit for the role at the time. So keep in touch with them. Make sure you send, you know, a follow-up, even if you get rejected. Ask for feedback. See if they'll give you some feedback on why you weren't um, good for this role. And just tell them, you know, you can you can send them some kind of message that, um, well, you know, feel free to keep my to keep to keep in touch and I'll be happy to hear if there are any similar roles opening in the future. Yeah, that's some of the best advice I think I've heard about establishing relationships with companies that you want to work at. Uh, I, I've, I don't think I've ever heard anyone explicitly vocalize that, hey, like these, pe these teams are always needing new people, right? Like it, it, if you're a decent candidate, you didn't fail in the first round, you've made it reasonably far in the interview, keep that conversation going. I mean, they liked you enough to bring you back. They liked you enough to, to have you as this part. Like in any of the future positions, if assuming you got fairly far, like you're probably at the top of their list if it's just a little bit you know, like a little bit different. I mean, to me, that's something that I, I really, really value in terms of advice there. Um, one other thing that you'd mentioned, which I also love, is that, uh, you, you know, you're practicing with your, uh, your, your fiance, correct? Um, and fiance, husband, should be married, yes, but COVID, yes. COVID doesn't let us. Um, and, uh, 
practicing with someone else is is he technically inclined or or not really not at all <laughs> not i at all. i think that that is actually a perfect scenario because if you feel like you can explain let's say like a coding challenge to someone that doesn't understand coding then you've definitely understand it well enough <laughs> um this is true and you part of what they're looking for in these things is can you talk your way through what you're doing you don't need someone technical to to sit there and listen to it's like kind of talking to the rubber duck when you're programming like uh, figuring out the problems it's that hey can can you just like write this down does it flow logically does this make sense and um you know anyone will do for that especially if you know they'll be willing to sit with you for for that long so <laughs> yeah 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 no but i think um, if you're going to practice with someone, it doesn't matter whether they're technically capable or not. If they are, great. If they're not, whatever. But use somebody, practice with them. Um, and and yeah, if you're and if you're doing it in another language like me, then definitely practice with a native of that language. <laughs> Incredible. So the last the last sorry the last section of this interview, I really want to focus more on some of the initiatives that you're a part of, some of the things that you're really passionate about. Uh, learning, obviously, one of those learning Spanish, learning all of this data analytics toolkit. Um, so there are kind of two elements that I that you you have uh, are heavily involved in here. So the first is the public speaking, and the second is this book a week challenge. So I'd first like to hear a bit more about your public speaking, why you've started to do more of it. Obviously, we're grateful for it because we're getting a lot of very excellent information, um, but also some of you know like why why should someone maybe be willing to, to put themselves out there and, and talk on a subject that they're excited about. Yeah, I think public speaking is a way to get your name out there, to build a brand. And and I, I mean, I really do enjoy it. Um, once you get past those initial nerves that I think everyone has, you have to get used to it. And one of the best ways to get used to it is just by doing it, by putting yourself on stage, putting yourself in front of people and learning how to cope with it. Um, and I've been doing public speaking maybe on a more professional level the last two, three years or so. And it's opened a lot of doors for me personally. So not just building my brand, my name, um, and people associating me with analytics. That's great. Um, but also it's also it's opened the door for me to travel. Um, so I have done, in person now, I've done uh, speaking tours across eight countries. It would have been more if it weren't for COVID. Um, and so virtually it's been over 20 that I've been giving talks around the world. And it's a great way just to open the door to, to get to travel and and mingle with other cultures. And then it's just, it's great for personal, personal growth. Um, and it's a very powerful skill to have. I mean, it's very, it's very applicable even in the workplace because at some point you're gonna have to give a presentation, whether it's to your team, your boss, your your office, and that's a form of, of public speaking as well. So it, it's very applicable, you know, in and out of the actual office too. Awesome. And you you kind of talked about some of the the drawbacks of uh, of of uh, the pandemic, but in in one sense, I think now more so than ever, it is easier to break into the speaking uh, the speaking opportunities. Because one, the, the like intimidation factor is a lot lower, right? Uh, for example, us talking via podcast, it's just us two. But, you know, frankly, thousands of people are going to listen to this. And so it's like, well, they're, they're, in theory, there's really no nerves because it's just us talking. We're friends. We're hanging out. But you get the benefit of, okay, I'm slowly acclimated to more people listening uh, rather than just like, I mean, I've been in this position where you're sitting there and you're looking out and there's hundreds of people there and you're like, the eyeballs on you, they just don't feel like they're there, which is which is a very fascinating thing to me. And I think that's a great way to kind of wet your palate or get started with either podcasts or or like virtual webinars, whatever it might be, because it just, like it to me, again, it's less less intimidating. It's less overwhelming. Um, and And we've also pulled down borders. So before it was more difficult because I couldn't just be traveling, you know, tomorrow to Japan to give a talk. Nowadays, they can, somebody can write me from there and say, hey, can you give a talk for tomorrow? I can, I can do it online. Um, so this is something that, well, I think we'll, we'll have a mix of it, you know, post pandemic, but that's another benefit of having these, this, all of this online and online speaking opportunities. You also don't have to worry about, um, about traveling and logistics. 
Yeah. Well, I'm definitely going to be calling you up for some notes on kind of the speaking tour type stuff. I mean, I, I really didn't get into the working with conferences or whatever that might be until this year. And this year has pretty much all been a, a, a bit of a crapshoot. So uh, and any travel tips, anything along those lines, I will be definitely looking forward to. Sounds good. Sounds good. Excellent. So I'd love to hear, I, as, as we've discussed, I'm a very avid reader. Uh, I, I'm extremely interested in hearing more about this book a week challenge that you've been doing. I think uh, I can't say enough good things about books. So I'm going to, I'm going to leave the, the floor to you. Yeah, you're, you're a big reader as well. So it's great to have this conversation with you. Um, so the challenge, this is something that I run on LinkedIn. It's hashtag book a week challenge. And I started it a couple of years ago to try to encourage others to get off their screens and to pick up better habits. So getting lost in books in my case. And I've read a book a week for years and I share my reading journey on LinkedIn and I'm, and I'm encouraging others to do the same, to post their reading, to pick up more of a habit. And this is about habit forming. I mean, for me, it's I wake up every morning with a book. I go to bed every, every night with a book. Uh, and if you find a way to put it into your day as a habit, instead of maybe those 20 minutes that you spend scrolling through Facebook, uh, you'll realize, you'll, you'll quickly realize how much you can you can get done, how much you can read in that, in that time. Um, so, so yeah, I definitely, I, I highly recommend our leader, our, our listeners, sorry, to join the challenge and to, uh, to read more books. Awesome. And you know, the, the, the habit thing is something that I, I obviously put a tremendous amount of value in as well. I mean, that's the basis for my 66 days of data challenge is that 66 days, according to, to James Clear, who's one of the kind of the habit gurus is the average amount of time. I know there are problem with, problems with averages, but it's the average amount of time that it takes to ingrain a new habit. And so, you know, to me, creating good data science habits, creating good like health habits, creating good um, like habits to get away from screen, which reading I think is for me at least very much a mental health and personal growth exercise. Uh, that's, that's how we achieve success at some point is by like the very little things that we do each day it's not just like one thing, big thing that we do once, although I guess that can happen. Um, but, you know, some of my favorite books actually happen to be about habits. So I, there's three books I've read about habits. One is Atomic Habits by James Clear. One is called Tiny Habits. One is called The Power of Habit. Um, I, I recommend reading all those and then definitely doing this book a week challenge. Um, I, I, I probably at the beginning of the year, I might, I might try and pick that up again. Uh, and I'd be happy, happy to post. I just read a very good one that I I'm itching to talk about. So, um, before, which one is it? You're so not going to tell it. <laughs> nope, nope, nope. No, it, it's called, um, oh my goodness. Uh, show your work. I forget who I, the yeah, author yeah. is, uh, but I heard it from, uh, Ali Abdal, who's, who's another big YouTuber. Uh, he does like a life philosophy organization, those types of things. And uh, it, it is very well written. It's like a quick read. It's kind of like a nightstand or, or coffee table book. But it just talks about why it's so important, especially now, to put yourself out there to um, share the process, not just like the results, but like people are interested in what you're doing. And it creates so many opportunities for you. There's so many different benefits. And there's also so many different ways to do it. And um, Anyone who's either in our space, whether we're speaking, whether we're creating a brand, anyone who wants to get a job, anyone who, you know, just wants to open as many doors as possible for them, I think that this book is is incredible. It was right up my alley, right what I needed to hear, perhaps maybe a year ago. But um, yeah, I was gonna say you're like a master of this because you've got the podcast, you've got the YouTube channel, you have 66 days of data. I think maybe you could have written the book as well. <laughs> uh, I, I'd say a jack of all content creation, a master of none. So, <laughs> but regardless, I, you know, this is something that sorry, I, I immensely believed in. And this book was a way of one, reinforcing it, uh, but two, also adding to it. There are some things about how to tell a good story that he has in there that I think I can definitely apply to my YouTube videos. You know, like every Disney story has the same arc, right? Basically, yeah. every, everything's going okay. Something happens, like 
there's a pivotal change like things start going well there's a, a like a big conflict something bad happens conflict gets resolved things get back to how they were going before but something's a little bit different and be or better or the person has learned something new and it's better um and you know like that's not something i I could frame a video like that pretty easily, but I've never never done it that way. Um, so it's, it's there interesting. Is a, there is an NLP analysis on this done quite a few years ago. Really? I, I forget who, um, University of Birmingham, maybe? Somewhere, but they did, a, they analyzed um, the phrases, the sentences during a movie, whether they were positive, negative, neutral. They mapped it over time and they tried to see which which path, which uh, trend was the type of movie that brought the most revenue so that you could model your your storytelling to follow that same, you know, whether it starts off positive and then drops and then comes back neutral or, um, but later offline, I can, I can find you the link. Yeah, please do. That sounds so fascinating to me. Very yeah. relevant for everything I do. <laughs> um, so before we go, last thing, I would love for you to share a couple of books that, that you also enjoy that you've perhaps read this year. Um, and also anything uh, else that you're working on, any any other last words of advice, any news, whatever that might be. Um, I am, uh, again, super grateful that you've been here and I'd love to give you a platform to share whatever you'd like. Yeah, so the, we've already talked, you know, my the thing I'm most passionate about is the Book a Week Challenge. Um, so I will share a couple books for, for listeners. So, it, and my favorites really depend on genre. It's difficult for me to pick an absolute favorite, but one of my top books, uh, data related, it's called Everybody Lies, um, Big Data, New Data, and What the Internet Can Tell Us About Who We Really Are. And this is definitely one of my all-time favorite books. And it was written by a guy who was doing his PhD thesis on trying to prove that the best way to understand the human psych um, is by analyzing our online behavior and specifically our search, our search habits. Um, so super, super interesting book. Um, and then as well, there's another one I like, Weapons of Math Destruction. This is on data ethics, also super interesting and, and very relevant for today's times. And then for a third book, something different. So another book that really changed my view of the world. And I came to learn a lot about human society and, and the modern world. And it's called uh, Guns, Germs and Steel by Jared Diamond. So those would be, yeah. it's tough, tough for me to pick top books, but those would be up there. Those would be definitely top. Um, yeah, no, I don't have any other, you know, um, initiatives beside that. That's my main one. I'm very, also very active in promoting like women in tech, diversity in tech. Uh, there is one initiative that I am a facilitator for. It's called I Am Remarkable. Um, you can also look up hashtag I Am Remarkable. There's a lot of posts with it. And this is a workshop that started out of Google but now it's internal and external. And it's a workshop that is run to help underrepresented groups learn to learn to like sell their worth in the workplace and beyond and learn to have confidence in themselves. So this is something also that anyone can get involved in. You can, um, you can go to the page online, just look up I Am Remarkable, you'll find it and you can find more information. There's lots of local workshops being run all over the world. Um, so yeah, I'm pretty much, you know, the book week challenge, I am remarkable pushing for, for diversity in tech. And besides that, if anyone is interested in connecting, staying in touch with my content, then you can, um, you can follow me on LinkedIn. That's where I'm, I'm most active. Awesome. Well, I will, for everyone, I'll put a link to all of the books. I am remarkable and your LinkedIn in the description or in, in one of the pinned comments. So it should be right below the video of this. Uh, thank again, you. No, again, thank you so much for coming in. I greatly enjoyed this conversation. And I think everyone who tunes in is going to really benefit from uh, from our dialogue here. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. And thanks to all of our, our listeners for tuning in today.